Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. You know, many of us are looking to level up. We want to want to be the best that we can be. Maybe inside you, you feel that I could be doing better at this, at my career, at my personal relationships, all of that. Let's take it to that place, but it usually begins with the right mindset, which is a buzzword that's going around these days. Having a positive mindset is the springboard to the change. How do you get that? How do you find that? How do you stay positive? What is this mindset thing? We're going to talk with somebody who helps people all the time move their lives forward, move their careers forward, give them extraordinary outcomes. And he's an amazing leadership coach. And he's with us today. Steve Mella joins us here on the program. Steve, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Steve. How are you? I'm fantastic. Love your name, by the way. Steve, it's yes. just, Steve's are good people. I, I, I was going to say the same to you. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the mindset word has been in the forefront, I want to say, for the last couple of years. And mm. We hear it. We kind of know what it means. Those of us who haven't done the deeper work, what is what is a mindset? Mm. I, I I love the way you even preface in the question because there is this sort of assumption energy around it. I'm just like, okay, I I think I know what I'm talking about when someone says mindset, positive mindset. I think I do. I don't think most people truly can say with great assurance that they understand it. At the heart of it, we're talking about found foundational principles in your ability to show up consistently. You know, that foundational principles that allow you to show up consistently. And what I like about presenting it that way is that that doesn't necessarily indicate whether it's going to be a positive or a negative mindset, because some of those foundational principles may have a lot of negative connotation, may have a lot of negative beliefs within them that are preventing you from showing up the way you would need for your mindset to show up. And that's why so much of my work is getting into the into the the weeds, if you will, and getting beneath the surface and saying, where are some of these fixed mindsets originating from? Where are some of these limiting beliefs originating from that are actually preventing you from showing up with that potentially positive mindset? Because the fact is, Steve, most of the time, we don't even know we're doing it. We have no idea that this voice or this energy or these beliefs are at play, and it is affecting the potential positive mindset that we could show up with each and every day. You know, interestingly, my perception with the word mindset is a positive mindset, but learning mm -hmm. from you now as we're talking about it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be positive. It's just a mindset, basically, I'll call it a GPS that is, to your point, consistent. Is that the right way to look at it? Absolutely, because the the use of that uh, metaphor, if you will, of a GPS is, okay, in many ways, the way in which we're showing up in our mindset is having a direct influence on the destination we're going to arrive at. It could be a destination of success and fulfillment. It could also be a destination of complete disappointment. You know, the fact of the matter is there is a journey taking place. And our mindset, I like to always call it, it's the fuel. It's the fuel that we're pumping into ourselves, potentially. We just got to make sure we're pumping in the right kind of fuel. How do we determine what the right fuel is and how do we change our mindset so that it, it it is always consistent and positive or negative it supports us yeah the first thing i always go to is influence and that comes in all shapes and sizes it, it in its most mm. direct form who are the people you're hanging out with every single day you know what impact are these individuals having on you and that can be as as close in proximity as a spouse as a mother, a father, it, it can be someone as close to you in that regard. It can also be some of the folks that we work with and we surround ourselves each and every day. I read something just recently, I think, when we actually look at the communication we have on a week-to-week -week basis, for those of us that do work in office spaces, I think three quarters of the people that we speak and communicate most with are the ones that we're working with, you know, and like that, that's a really alarming statistic when well, you think about I it. I heard this th for a couple of years now. You mm. are the sum of the five people you spend right. the most time with. That's right. And, and it's one of those, it's one of those, even going back to where we started here, just like you kind of believe it, you think you understand it. And even when people show, uh, share those kind of statistics, 
I don't think people really appreciate it or understand uh, and and accept it. I think they're just like, well, you know, I, I can pretty much manage that. I, if, if I've got someone in my world who's being negative and who's directly, you know, attacking me in some ways, dif- it, verbally, whatever it is, every single day, it's not. I'm not carrying that. I'm not taking that around. But we are. We are mm. taking it around. We are carrying it, and it is having a direct influence. And I always use this word community. I say, what what would it look like for you to create a community where you're at the center of this community? And the only reason that community exists is to facilitate your growth. How how differently would you go about selecting those individuals that you do, in fact, Mm. spend the majority of your time with if the one thing everybody had in common that was part of your community was serving the fulfillment of your potential? serving your personal growth how differently would you look at those folks that you're potentially communicating with i don't want to i don't want to hear that <laughs> <laughs> and i and, and this is the beauty of my work steve is like i can be i could be running a workshop like and ask a question like that and everybody in their seats just like uh oh i i don't think i can answer this question or i don't want to answer this question or i hate that i hate this question whatever yeah. it is yeah cuz think about that for a moment you're Selecting your dream team, the people that are going to influence you the most, the people that are going to support you the most, it stops here. I'm changing everything. I'm going to cherry pick, hand pick those people. This one, that one, this one. Would it be the people that are around you right now? I'm going to say probably not. The, probably there's, good, there, not. there's going to be some that you're going to weed For out. Sure. There's going to be you know yeah. some some core people there. Um, <laughs> it's a, that's a wake up right there. It is. It is. And and again, I, you know, part of my profession is asking those questions that frankly create discomfort in people. Like I, 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 I'm an advocate that we, we are better from a growth fulfillment standpoint when we experience discomfort daily and mm-hmm. asking questions like this of yourself each and every day, or maybe just looking across your typical month, you know, going a little bit broader than just a day to day saying, Hey, on a typical month, who might be those five right now? in my world that are having a direct influence on me. And let's say this time next year, 12 months from now, do I see myself growing? Do I see my mindset shifting in a positive direction by surrounding myself with these five people as I do right now? Or is it time to maybe make a couple of substitutions here? Do Mm. Do I need to start having a little bit more insistence on, listen, there's a standard that I need for influence around me and until I do the work on what that standard needs to be, I can't really filter out who it is I need around me. So it starts setting that standard, and then we can recruit. I like to use that word intentional, recruiting of people that you need to be influencing you on a day-to-day basis. So let's put the microscope on that for, for just a moment. Those people that are in our lives, it's my belief, we know the answers to everything. It's in us. We know. We ignore it. Logic gets in the way, things get in the way, and we don't listen to it. But we know those people, let's say the five that we're talking, we mm-hmm. know a few of them don't really belong in our lives to support what we really want to do in terms of our goals. Why are we hanging on to them? Hmm. The main reason I have noticed over the years is that it's just too big a, it's too big a conversation to have. It's too big a decision to make. There's something there that we're putting ourselves so much in their shoes that we're forgetting that what's best for us. And that is a really difficult thing for us as human beings to do is to just stand on top of a mountain and say, Mm. I'm going to do what's best for me because everyone's going to point up at you and say, well, that's selfish. That's a very selfish approach to have to life. And then you go, well, listen, for those that are pursuing fulfillment, you cannot pursue fulfillment on somebody else's terms. That's not how fulfillment works. At the heart of it is a willingness to do what's best for you. And in the and, and in the process of doing that, hopefully you get to pull some people into that. You get to bring the kind of influence around you that you know is either going to accelerate that or bring that to fruition. And, and that's the beauty of this work. It's It's difficult to get selfish, but at the heart of that selfishness, Believe it or not, as you grow and you develop and this mindset of yours becomes this positive mindset, who do you think people are going to want to hang around with? Who do you think people are going to gravitate toward? The person who's not pursuing fulfillment and doing things on other people's terms or the person that is pursuing fulfillment and is resonating this positive mindset 
each and every day in the work that they do. Mm. And when we think of that, we know those people, you know, those are the people that you want to hang with. I can, I can name Mm -hmm. four of them right now that I, in my circles, I need to call two of them. Haven't talked (laughs) to them in a while, Um, but I can see them. Like they, they have something going on. And I believe it's everything that we're talking about. I also believe that those of us who hang on to the people in our lives that don't support us, maybe we're not hanging on to them because of the guilt factor, you know, to, to let them go. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe it's fear of abandonment. We don't want to feel alone. They serve a purpose in our lives, but it's not really the right kind of purpose. Um, mm-hmm. this, I, I'm, sh- I'm sure there's a variety of reasons. You said the word terms. And it, it, it popped interest in me. I joined a men's group about, uh, let's see, eight, about 10 weeks ago, not even. And nice. been a lot, a lot going on, a lot of growth, a lot of leadership learning, um, community service and all of that. But one of the fundamentals of the group is define your terms. You need mm. to define your terms. What are they? Call them boundaries, whatever they are. Do you feel that that should be the starting point before we do any of this other work? I do. And and, and again, you can always answer these sort of questions with it depends just based on who it is that's coming into it. But let's speak to the majority. And I I agree with you completely on that is that to the majority, there's no doubt that creating some form of terms on the front end is is so important. And what, what I find interesting is that the work around community and that direct influence is one of the most effective way to create those terms because i love creating that analogy of hey this is a community population is probably no more than five that's enough you can have many people outside of it but these are your go-tos these are your ones that when when things hit the fan you want these folks on your side you want them on Mm -hmm. speed dial you want them to be able to come knocking on your door and be that shoulder be that voice be that ear that you need at that time The reason I talk about that is it forces you to immediately look in the mirror and say, if I'm going to ask for this sort of community around me, that's a big ask. I better be super clear with what it is I need from these folks. Mm. And in order for me to know what I need from these folks, I'm going to have to start getting way clearer on what I need for me. What are my terms and conditions for me to pursue what I believe is my best self? And the beauty of things like men's groups, which I'm such an advocate for, is that on the way in, you are all in agreement. It's like, listen, as we come into this, this is what we're signing up for, folks. And if you cannot if you cannot keep up with this, if you cannot honor this, I'm sorry, but this probably isn't going to be the space for you. And how is that any different to what I've been sort of explaining here up until now? You know, having that, having that commitment to terms, to conditions where you want to operate within and being so clear about it that there's almost this understanding of like, listen, this is how you come in, but this is also how you get kicked out. And that mm. is okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Cause that's, that's, <laughs> that's how that, the group them in operates. You show up late, you're out. That's it. that's it. Because it's disrespectful to the others. You get one pass and that's it. Sure. Um, you're like the mirror. You're the mirror in front of us because mm-hmm. I said that I need to call these two people. And actually one of them referred me to this group I haven't talked to him. I saw him for you know a quick second here and there. I haven't really had a conversation deeper with him in, oh, I don't even know. Um, why haven't I called him? Hmm. Because I haven't officially, in my mind, defined what my true terms are and what my expectations are, even for that relationship. And I keep putting it off. And I didn't realize it until you just said that. Yeah. And what I love about that example, Steve, is that you're honoring this key component to any community that you build is that of respect. And respect is this reciprocal part of the relationship. In this case, from what I'm hearing here, not to put my coaching hat on right now, but I'm going to do it anyway, um, is, is, is this notion of like, hey, listen, you have such a respect for this relationship and an appreciation for the guidance that this individual is giving you by leading you into this men's group. You probably want to make sure that you're at a point in terms of the commitment, the investment, the progress that you've made to be able to then turn around and say, hey, because of your investment in me, I want you to hear the return. This is the return that you got for that investment. And that is when the community is at its absolute finest, is when we not only recruit these folks in, but they start to shift our mindset, going back to that original part of this, they shift our mindset to a point of, hey, 
I have the utmost respect for these people because of what I've asked of them. The last thing I want to do is to ever show up with no return for the investment that they're putting into me. I want yep. to fill, I want to bring bags of return to these people because these folks are the ones that are willing to invest in me. Exactly it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you do what you do. Um, and I didn't, I, I, I kept putting it off and I didn't really define it in my mind. I'm a big proponent of writing it down. Like when oh, yeah. you write it down, Research has shown the connection from here to the hands, and I don't mean typing, I mean writing, so mm -hmm. that it is making a deeper connection. Now it's staring you in the face, and and it's clear. You got clarity. Steve, mm -hmm. tell us about your journey. What got you to the point where you are now? By being the complete opposite of everything that we have been speaking about so far. Um, you know, for, for me, my climb, if you will, my journey to where I am today uh, it started at a very, very low level. And I was a former uh, world-class swimmer. Uh, I, I swam in college over here in the United States. That's how I ended up in the US. Uh, don't let the British accent uh, confuse you at all. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I, 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 made that, uh, I made that a career in many ways until about my 20, 23, 24. And then I, once I retired, um, I moved into swim coaching and then I had an issue uh, being able to work here in the United States and ended up having to move back to England very suddenly. Wasn't the plan. And then I was faced with me, myself and I for the first time in a real long time. And I wasn't a huge fan of that guy. <laughs> I really wasn't. Mm. And spent about six to 12 months kind of sitting in this pool of self-pity and you know, just uh, not really loving myself a whole lot and got to this point where it was like, well, listen, there's there's a way out of this. You have to want to get out of it firstly. And I believe that I did. Uh, so I started to just do some of that self-reflection work at the heart of that foundation, as I, as I alluded to at the beginning here, is like, what are some of these foundational principles that I once had when I felt like life had so much direction that I'm now missing because life feels like it has no direction? And I was able to just start to latch on to some of those foundational principles that made me the athlete that I was. I started to gravitate back towards that version of myself and realize he hadn't gone anywhere. He was just hiding. You know, he was just hiding. He didn't want to come out. He didn't want to be himself anymore because he wasn't a swimmer anymore. It's like, how do I show up in the world as this different version of myself? What does that part of this process look like? But once I established some of those foundational principles, we're talking about circa 2013, 2014 now. I've been on this decade journey now, which is in no way come to an end. I, I, you know, now the appetite for it continues to grow daily. But the part of that has just been continually putting this investment into myself foundationally to show up with the kind of mindset that's going to allow me to, in many ways, capitalize on life. I love putting it that way to to clients when I first start working with them. Is like, are you capitalizing on? The positions that life is presenting you right now a lot of the time people go i don't even know what you mean like you know i don't, I don't never mind yes or no it's just like I, I i wouldn't even know what that looks like it's like well when we start to do this foundational work and when we start to grow and our mindset shifts in the right way we actually walk into rooms now and say how can i capitalize on this and i don't mean monetary i don't mean in some way getting ahead on somebody else i just mean hey how do I make the most of this world that I'm in right now, this life that I'm living right now, these relationships that I've built right now? Um, and that's been my journey over the last decade. And like I said, it, it just continues to accelerate and grow because going back to my point earlier, the return is just so great. Mm. It's interesting. And thank you for sharing all of that and your transparency that mm. you were at a major athletic capacity. Yeah. You know, that many of us don't even get to, to touch that or see that, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, in the sports world. It could be anything. You I, you were at the top of your game there for a while. Yep. Um, and then things changed. Did you find that your purpose, your life purpose disappeared as you knew it when you stopped swimming? And now you were faced with, well, now what do I do? Did it feel that yeah. way? It 100% did, Steve. And, uh, and the, the issue there wasn't necessarily that I was losing sight of that purpose. It was more that the purpose had been incorrectly built in the first place. You know, I think that's the, mm. that's the piece of this that I always come back to. And I work with, even to this day, whenever I see some athletes that I've known over the years or, you know, parents that introduce their kids to me and say, hey, you know, I know the work that you used to do as a swim coach. Do you have 30 minutes to talk to them? The one thing I always try to get across to them is like, if you're defining who you are based on the results that you deliver, then you are defining yourself all wrong. 
you know you you have to look at yourself as more than just the swimmer the football player the basketball player the whatever you are or like, i even talked to a few parents who have kids in the creative arts like because again that is an all-encompassing thing that you have to fully commit to and it's when we go down these paths of this all-encompassing approach, the all-or-nothing mindset, if you will, which is exactly what I was guilty of when I was an athlete. The moment that thing's taken away from you, you go from all to nothing. Like You end up at nothing after having been all for so long. So the more that you can actually go into that work while you're in it and say, what mm. else am I? What else do I bring to this elite level of athletics of performance of whatever it might be that I'm so committed to what who else am I how else do people appreciate the work that I do because there's so much more to our identity than just simply the results that we put on a scoreboard or whatever it might be or the the sign that you put on your desk or the sign that you put on the door of your office that's right a lot of us live behind our jobs and that's how that's we right. are defined but like you say we're much more than that and a similar situation that you described, a friend of mine has a friend and guy is very successful, lives in a penthouse suite overlooking Central Park, New York City, you know, top of the game, hit it big, fantastic, life has been great. He retired and my friend went to pay him a visit last week and opens the door to his place and this gentleman is balled up on the floor crying, doesn't know what to do mm -hmm. because he retired. His life has changed. He has everything, mm -hmm. but his purpose was what he always did. And now he decided to retire. He doesn't know how to retire. He doesn't know how to handle it. So he's working through that with a therapist. But one would think, you know, if we don't walk in their shoes, you look at that person like, oh, like he's got everything, you know, snap yep. his finger. You know, he's got uh, so many financial resources behind him, um, but it's not what we think it is. Mm -mm. No, and, and that's what's been really interesting about this newest chapter of my life working as an executive coach is when I got into this, I had this idea of what this was going to be. I, I figured that I would help these executives, these business owners produce results at the highest level of whatever their respective industry may be. And then the more I got into the work, I realized where the work needed to be done. And I was right back talking to said executive, said business owner, like it was my 19, 20-year-old self as an athlete. Because at the heart of it was that they were attaching all their outcomes to their own worth. And that was a slippery, slippery slope. And so mm. I've come to really establish myself now within this industry as an advocate for all professional growth, all optimal performance, as I call it in my work. All of that starts with personal investment personal development, personal growth, and even going back to where we started here, personal mindset, that yeah. personal mindset, if that mindset is only influenced by outcomes on a professional level, that is a dangerous, very fragile, very volatile mindset that you're going to have day in, day out. When we get comfortable with what I call our optimal self, then that optimal self gets to show up in any respective industry, any respective scenario and show up as your best self and then optimize performance based on that version of yourself that you've built this incredible bulletproof foundation around because you've been working so dang hard on that personal side of growth. Can't do it alone. That's my belief. Nope. You can't. <laughs> I mean, even, nope. even in a few minutes, you've, you held a mirror up to me. Why I didn't call this gentleman and uh, why I've been holding back on it? Because I, <laughs> I want to make the call count and I, I want to make sure I'm ready. Uh, and I am. But, you know, it's uh, I, I just put it aside and, and we all do that. Um, yeah. How does it work with you, Steve? If somebody wants to change their mindset and really, really change their life, do you do like a, a free discovery call? I certainly do. Yeah. And the, the one thing I... I'm a huge advocate for just to kind of piggyback off uh, what you were just saying there, Steve, is, you know, I have my own coach and I have my own therapist. You know, I, I am someone who is not sitting here saying, hey, invest in my services, but not doing the same for myself. I, I would never allow myself from an integrity standpoint to get to that point. And so to your point of, hey, we can't do this alone. Here I am spouting off all of this stuff about personal growth as if I'm some form of expert and I don't need help with it, but that couldn't be further from the truth. You know, the truth is I invest in this stuff in order to show up and be that support, be that voice for so many others. But if you are someone who's listened to this and like, Hey, I need a piece of this. I need to just know 
where on earth I might start. Even if you don't want to go into any long-term engagement, you just want that insight and some of that support the way it turns out I've provided to you here today, Steve. Um, you can just always reach out to me, Steve, at Career Competitor, which is my my, my website. Um, or you can always go to just Instagram and find me at Coach Steve Mella as well. Uh, but just please, I, I love making time for folks, grabbing a virtual coffee, 30 minutes, 45 minute discovery call. I'll be happy to help. A Miller, by the way, is spelled M E L L O R. <laughs> Um, That's it. Fantastic talking with you. I love your clarity, how this stuff can seem a little woo-woo to some of us, but you make it very clear. And I think most importantly, you walk the walk and talk the talk, even in having a uh, you know therapist, coach yourself, which uh, is admirable, really is. Yeah, I appreciate it, Steve. I appreciate this time, appreciate this platform to talk about this stuff. And like you said, it's there's room for education on this all the time, and I'm I'm here to provide it. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. We'll be right back. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Hey, Dad, how do airplanes fly? What's in this box? Can I touch this? Where does sand come from? Is this tree good for climbing? What happens if I mix these two things together? How are babies made? What does this thing do? Kids are curious about everything, including guns. Talking to them about gun safety in your home is a good first step, but you can do more. Always keep your guns locked, unloaded, and stored separately from ammunition. Storing your guns securely is the best way to prevent family fire, including unintentional shootings. For more information on safe gun storage and ways to keep your family safe, visit endfamilyfire.org. That's endfamilyfire.org. What do we keep in the attic? What's this thing called? Can I ride my bike backwards? Like I said, kids are curious. It's up to us to keep them safe. Brought to you by End Family Fire, Brady, and the Ad Council.